Okay, thank you. Actually, I have two questions. They're kind of lighter than what I had in mind before. But for Edmund, I recall seeing your opening credits, and I saw Gucci in it. What's the relationship between Gucci and the River of Exploding Durian again? And yeah, and the other one for Anocha. Like, actually, this is with regards to titling because I've seen the tight title of by the time he gets dies Dao Kanung, right? So it's a sub district of. Thomburi district in Bangkok. So why this difference, you know, in the titling? Is it a local release thing or do you have an alternative meaning behind it? So my, my best friends in Gucci, um, they supported the entire film. No, I'm kidding. So basically uh, in 2013, uh, the project was invited to the Biennale College in Venice. Um, so I, uh, I had to go there with my producer for a week to develop the script. So that workshop was f f sponsored, financed by Gucci. So contractually, I have to put Gucci in the opening and ending credits, uh, even though they're not going to give me any money, uh, which they didn't. So yeah, so that was our relationship. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I'll make my next film with your money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, the, the Thai title and the English title uh, have no correlations, um, but I, I like them both in, for different reasons, and I chose them for dif different reasons also. Um, so by the time it gets dark, it's actually a name of a, a song, uh, which I was listening to quite a lot when I first started to develop the project. And I, at that point, I thought it was going to be just a working title. And over time, I began to like it more and decided to keep it. But uh, interestingly, it, you know, it's a song by Sandy Denny from the Fairport Convention, uh, originally like, yeah, like a 1970s song. But I only knew of this much later. The, the version I was listening to was by Yo Tango, which was a cover version. And then when I found out that it was a cover version, I thought that it was quite, apt, you know, in terms of what my film is about, in a way, it's like the appropriation of, of, of something, yeah. So, um, yeah, like I said, you know, I, I decided to keep it because I felt it was working and, yeah. And, um, but the Thai title, Dao Kanong, is a district in, in the suburbs of Bangkok, or Thun Buri, which is just across uh, the river on the other side of Bangkok. And it's, um, it's a juxtaposition of the, the words Dao and Kanong, which I thought was quite interesting. Dao is star in Thai, and Kanong is wild. So uh, the literal translation would be wild star, which actually doesn't suit the district at all. <laughs> There's nothing wild about it. It's, it is quite uh, plain and uh, normally you would have no reason to visit this place unless you live or work in the, the, the area. So, but I thought it was interesting that if, if, you're, if you drive, if you're a driver in Bangkok, you get on the expressway, you will see the sign Dao Kanok everywhere. And I never understood why. And no one, I, I keep asking people and no one knows why. What's the significance of this place? You know, it's, um, is 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 quite intriguing in that sense. But so it's not so in a way it's not really about uh, the meaning of of the the the, the words itself, the, but um, the feeling that that you get if you drive on the expressway because you always see the sign that pointing to dark and all. So it's kind of like some there's a sense of mystery to it. You know, it's like somewhere that's quite. Somewhere, really, you know, and um, and that is not a destination in itself. Yeah, so it's, it, it gives me the sense of something that is um, linked to being on a journey because you know you you would only see it if you drive. So like a sense of um, journey and yeah. So, so in and and so I think it, that in a way it correlates to the the the. Uh, in terms of the feelings, uh, by the time it gets dark, because you know it conveys a sense of of, of time, yeah, or, or time and and 
traveling. Yeah, which I think is quite related to the film. I know, and I have two questions. The first question I have is uh, with regards to images of violence and the portrayal of brutality. So uh, yesterday, I know Chai, you spoke about how you didn't want to use images from Tamasat or archival footage from Tamasat itself. But then I think in Edmund's film, you use a projection of Tamasat, if I'm not wrong, or was that? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yep. Okay, so then it leads me on to my second question. Um, that is, when does um, the, your strategies, and this is addressed to all uh, filmmakers, when does strategies of um, illusion and uh, evasion through fiction um, become so loose that it ceases to become political. So what I'm trying to say is that um, I'm not trying to go recourse into the objective or into uh, the real per se, but what I'm trying to say is that this ambivalence that you're trying to portray in most of these films is fundament fundamentally amoral, which means that it can be used from the right or left. And we have seen how um, this uh, amorality is used in ambivalence in this, and how the state uses this political ambivalence in discourses of forgetting and forgetting a particular <coughs> incident. So when, what I'm trying to say is that, yeah, when, when does the fiction lose its political impact, you know? You know, uh, Nietzsche once said that uh, there's no truth, but just interpretation. So I guess, uh, you know, this, there's the danger about fiction and uh, about being ambivalent, because it is depends on the individual and how they use that information or knowledge to, to uh, in, uh, <coughs> interpret, to, to sort of... Uh, uh, guide the whole conversation, discourse, or, or, or even the historical narrative to a certain... Uh, it's part and parcel of the game. It's, it's nothing we can do about it. But just be aware of it. That's how I can say it. Uh, I have to jump in here. Because what I'm trying to say... Uh, I mean, one of my biggest worries is that um, this sort of fictionalizing as much as it uh, effectively portrays this political ambivalence and tension, even within activism itself, um, could also lead to quietism and even worse, the slippery slope of political nihilism. Um, and I'm just being I'm antagonistic just let's, uh, let's see what the filmmakers think again about this, this issue of where do you draw the line or must you, must you draw the line? Is there a point which you need to, to remain grounded in the, the historical to, re, to retain this political efficacy. Um, no, I thank you for, for the question because it's something that I also grapple with. You know, is um, especially after the the film has been well received in Thailand by the establishment. You know, it poses this question like, um, you know, is in a way, you know, does it make the film less political because it has received all these awards, you know, um, in Thailand. I'm only talking about, you know, the, the, in the Thai context because, you know, my, the reason why I wanted to make the film was actually to open up the discussions and to make people remember um, about the massacre. So, um, I think it actually I don't know. I'm I'm also ambivalent about this myself, and and, and cinema as as the, you know, a medium to deal with like uh, historical facts or you know national trauma, which I think in a way my film addresses that you know is um, uh, the limitations of cinema. But at the same time, I really wanted to transcend to for for the film to transcend beyond that, so that it shouldn't be about just about the reflection of of society, it, um, it should encourage uh, dialogues. And, and I think to some extent it has, maybe not as much as I would like it to. Um, yeah, so 
Yeah, it certainly entered into a certain kind of, I mean, right now there's a lot of discussion about this starting to come together. It's starting to get a new level of attention and this is definitely part of that, a, a key part of that, that discussion, that greater attention, even if it may be tangential in terms of the fictional mm -hmm. form. Yeah. So it has its effect on another level. Uh, actually, I, I don't think that uh, the films that, at least how I look at their films in my, the, the, I, the act of actually creating those films, these films are already an, a political act in the sense that they, they create some kind of uh, disturbance, some kind of dissonance. I call it interpretation and creativity uh, to the assisting um, discourse, I guess. So, uh, uh, that, but then you were saying that being politically ambivalent, I would imagine people were doing it, like for example, cutting the pubic hair in front of the camera. That will be very, this, that is one way of doing it. There are other, many other ways to do it. And uh, I just want to say that it's not easy, it's, sometimes I feel that it's easy to get a film banned. Sometimes. <laughs> but I won't say that they are, they is, 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 is a, it's a bad thing or it's a good thing. The, what I'm trying to say is that there are many ways to do it. And uh, there are many approaches to do it. And I always don't want, I don't, I, I've never, and I don't think I will, start out to make a film to be banned. I want to create a film that is uh, able, that a lot of people can talk about it and discuss it, and not uh, be shocked by it, because just because they want to be shocking, they want to be you know, confrontational. I prefer a more calm, reasonable way of talking. And, and that is just one way. So there are many interpretations of the, the whole idea of uh, you know, creating a film or a discourse or political work. I think the one thing that maybe we all have in common here is um, we really true believers in the power of fiction you know, to tell the truth. And I think it's, like I said, you know, I was actually developing the idea for a documentary about the massacre. But I realized that it would be very didactic and, um, and I didn't want to make that, uh, that, that kind of film. And I think instead, of, uh, it would actually only dilute the significance of, of the massacre. Um, yeah, and I wanted it to, to, to be really open and so that people could have different readings of it. And in that way, actually, in the long term, I think it, it, it would mean more to, you know, it would contribute more to the, the discussion. Yeah, so that it won't be like a close subject. Uh, other questions out there? Uh, we have a microphone over here. Yeah, it was actually okay until you said that. Um, and not because of, um, not because of what you said, but maybe it's my understanding. Um, to me, fiction is fiction. What you do is always political. What any, every art, kind of art, is political. And it's always ambiguous, it's always ambivalent. And like you said, what Nietzsche said, that, that part about being open to interpretation and then the dialoguing and all that, I think that's all good. I didn't have this impression, because I think it would be confusing for me, that fiction necessarily leads to truth. And I think by truth, I like to leave here thinking that truth is not necessarily about the historical event, it is really truth about a lot of other things that are the way we make decisions, the way politics come out, the way human life is, human nature, you know, all those things that sort of, as a viewer, after you see that, you think, oh, I, I, I learned something about myself or my country or my whatever. And so hopefully I know how to read today's political situation better. You know, the, the, there's this thing about historians always wanting to say that if you know history, you would have seen the movie before and that you are not scared by what you see today because you would have known that this has happened before. I think somebody said something about cyclical, that things happen and that things do come back. So what does that mean to me? That means that when I watch your kind of films and I read fiction and all that, I build in me certain resilience that, that I, I can deal with this because I've seen it, you know, it's, it's been seen before. And I think that is the 
truth part. I, when I watch your films, I, I wouldn't be interested in whether or not you got the historical facts right, got the dates right, got the number of students right, you know, got the campus right, got the what right. You know what I mean? That, that's, that's not your role. Then you're making a documentary. But it's, it's that kind of human nature truth that I thought you would be going after. And I suspect they would say, they, in fact, you did say that in the discussion with me this morning, that fic fiction enables you to get at truth rather than fact. So I think this is so something for self. You know, it's, 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 it's using it as a springboard. You know. facts, but there's a lot more other truths that seem more interesting to get to than historical truth. Yeah, facts and truth are not the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're on the same. I, I, I want to, are there other people who haven't asked? Uh, Sorry. Uh, I'm just curious about the seemingly common aesthetic strategy that all the directors use, which is like a combined use of slowness and the long take. Um, because at Edmund's Q&A, he mentioned that he was influenced by Ho Xiao Xian and Edward Yang, and both of these directors make films about Taiwanese society and politics. And speaking to Green before, he said he was influenced by Mizoguchi and uh, the Greek director, Angelopoulos, who makes films about Greek history. I'm, I'm not that sure about Anochas and Angi's films. So I'm just wondering what's your like, philosophical or aesthetic or moral basis for the use of the long take and slowness? Angi, you want to start? <coughs> I'm, I, I was born and raised in a Javanese family, which is they are slow. If you, if you go to Jogja and you see the dancing, like six hour dancing or, or, the, or the mini dancing of six hour dancing is 30 minutes dancing, which is slow. And if you see Wayang Kulit, it takes eight hours minimum. It can be uh, 10 hours or 12 hours and it keep you awake until uh, until morning. So I think uh, I, I grew up with this this kind of cinematic experiences. So I don't I don't have any uh, uh, answer on on how. Of course, I see a lot of uh, uh, style using this slowness or or long take or something. But I think I do realize that I I, I grew up in those kind of of things. So also I I. I I stay in a in a in a in a house that far away from the city. So every time I go, since I, I was in a high school, I ride my motorcycle at 30 minutes, like one shot <laughs> to to the school, and it's happened like until until now <laughs> when I go to from house to the, my office in the, in the city. So I think it's 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 kind of a, the biggest influence of of my style. Style, or oh, because in front of my film. Yeah, I don't know how to answer this question. I, um, I never think my films are slow. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. Even I was actually the first time this happened to me was actually with my first film, my first feature, and I started to hear this comment that it was a slow film, and I, I was actually very surprised. <laughs> I. Yeah, I didn't think it was slow. I had a lot of cuts, but people still felt it was slow. Yeah, so um, I think it's yeah. Everyone has their own pacing, I think, and it's yeah. I, I mean, I could easily say also that I've you know I've watched uh, uh, like uh, Ho Xiao Xian or Edward Young, but I don't know if I could identify with those films because my pacing was already like that or I have been informed by you know their styles. I think it goes both ways, you know, you yeah, yeah, and, and then maybe for him too, I don't know. Um yeah. I and I could actually right now in my head I'm thinking of by the time it gets dark and I think there are not too many long shots in terms of duration. I can think of of course there's one shot which is which goes on for quite some time, but is the interview um, the two characters, and it's it's just one shot of uh, two shot of them talking to each other. But apart from that, I yeah, honestly, I I I can't. I don't think that they are necessarily slow. 
the other scenes. But I don't know. <laughs> I'm, maybe I don't have enough distance. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I didn't feel that my film was that slow. I mean, that, that's why I call it Bureau of Exploring Durance because it felt like a political thriller to me. No, no, I'm, uh, <laughs> no, no I, I mean, I, I do. I mean, I was influenced by their cinema, but at the same time, I do watch like Marvel stuff, uh, Hollywood stuff, you know, like, you know, <laughs> Dunkirk. <laughs> so. I thought Dunkirk was slow. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought it was pretty slow. Like, yeah. I was like, oh man, it slow takes forever. Well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I think it's sort of like a, you know, it, it's the way that we chose to tell the story. Um, I mean, for for me, uh, yeah, I, I maybe I I, I, could, I can't imagine my story being told in a, an Edgar Wright sort of style, you know, like Baby Driver, because it's that sort of story. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I I and at the same time, I was also trying to avoid like trying to make the film too slow. Uh, so, so when, when it's still, yes, I, I got people telling me that it was really slow, um, especially my mom. Uh, she was like, oh no, why can't you make films that are like, you know, t the TV, like, yeah, so I'm like, oh, you know, I fell asleep like half, like, like half an hour in, I'm like, oh, thanks mom, you know. So, yeah, I guess uh, everyone, maybe we are so used to, uh, like mainstream cinema, they do, uh, <laughs> have a different sort of rhythm uh, compared to the stuff that we make. Uh, but also because we are telling uh, different sorts of stories. Um, so I think that's the reason why um, people are not that used to our pacing. Um, so it's true, like, I, I, sometimes I do fall asleep like watching some Hollywood films. Uh, I, I am very ashamed to say that I fell asleep watching uh, Fast and Furious 8. I, mean, I, I liked 7, but I fell asleep watching 8. Uh, so you know, it's one of those things. Uh, for me, it's just like using a way to tell a story, finding my own uh, pacing and rhythm. Yeah. Like I watch, uh, fall asleep a lot in movie, like action films. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Do you think they were too fast for us? Like, <laughs> I think the um, I don't find a difference between a good, a slow film or quick film, a film with a lot of cuts and a film with no cuts at all. A good film is a good film, an interesting film is an interesting film. Uh, I mean, some of these interesting films that I like with lo lots of cuts, like Hitchcock's films, there are lots of cuts, but I, I find it very interesting. And of course, Kenji Mizukichi, which is a filmmaker that I, I love, and uh, which I can very re re relate because I feel that he got this rhythm that I, I'm closest to my take. For example, he gave a score to uh, Miles Davis and uh, maybe Charlie Parker. They will play it very differently because that is the way, I think you call it intonation, how they phrase it. And then once you buy a ticket to watch a certain filmmaker, you are buying his, the way how you phrase certain uh, notes. And you just have to live with it. If you don't want to listen to this, the way he plays it, then you go to another uh, musician. That's how I, I, I look at it. And also, I think there's a matter of taste or so. Uh, I like Chinese calligraphy because when I was a student in Chinese school, I studied Chinese calligraphy. I always like calligraphy. There's one long, uh, long stroke, not the one in block forms. And I like it because you have to think about it. You have to put it inside your head, and then in one breath, you have to just do it. And sometimes you get it wrong. It's okay. Then you do it again. That's how I approach filmmaking. I, I cut the film in the camera. I don't cut the film in the editing room. So that's a slightly different approach. And as I say, different interpretation of our world. OK, the powers that be have granted us times for another question or two, if we've got one. Yes. Yes. OK, so all this meta textual things aside, I just want to ask one last question on the idea of intellectualization. Do you all, any of you, or all of you, given that you have chosen this fictional narrative medium, do you find yourself sometimes either struggling or having to decide consciously that you want to make works that, that say more visceral as opposed to something that's easily intellectualized? Because such as for I know just by the time it gets stuck, you get that very organic sense for everyone's film here. You have that very, very organic sense of movement and not just 
temporarily or in terms of spatial awareness, but in terms of how everything develops in a narrative profile. So just, yeah, that's the thing I want to ask. This visceral versus the intellectual, and did you find yourself grappling with that? Given the subject matter at hand, of course. An ideal, an ideal film for me should, should evolve your body, mind, and soul. That's how I, I feel. It should have a balance of that. And, uh, and that's, uh, for every project that I do, uh, I think that's what I'm trying to uh, reach, or just at least attempt to reach, yeah. Um, I mean, for me, actually when it comes to filmmaking, I'm, I, I'm very instinctive. It's more like intuitive, so I don't really storyboard. Uh, I prefer to do it like while I'm on the spot. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really more about, I don't really like all intellectualize like, how I want to tell a story or da da da. Um, like, you know, for me, it's more like emotionally, like how I would tell it. Um, so, I mean, yeah, yeah I, I, I guess that's it. Yeah, it's nice, yeah. Yeah, I guess for me, um, the intellectualization would only occur when I was writing, um, in the writing of the script and in in the editing. But you know, during the shoot itself, is yeah, I was always responding to what was happening on that particular day and that particular place and time. So very often I would shoot something that was not in the script, and so. In a, so in that sense, the the film was was quite organic. Um, yeah, it it was always evolving, in every stage until until it finished. Yeah, mm. I never really consciously tried when I was on set, you know, to intellectualize it because you know you're deal, dealing with a lot of people and there, there are practical matters to consider with the actors and the crew. So, but in editing, yes, yeah. I don't really know about the question actually, <laughs> because I make a film for uh, make a statement of this time. So I think I'm happy to do it. 